Um, is there anyone here? Uh, is this, this, um, this is a Zoom meeting, it's being recorded. Um, is there anyone here for public comment? I see uh, someone named Dennis here. Raise your hand if you'd like to speak during public comment. And you can raise your hand by doing so in, under reactions on the bottom of your screen. Or you can show yourself and wave your hand. Mm, there's that. All right, looks like Dennis is not interested in uh, public comment. Do you see anybody else here? I don't see no. anyone else. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, so being no, there's no public comment. Um, we'll close the public comment session and we'll open the Board of Health. Do we need to, do we need to remind me, do we need to have a, a vote to open the session? I don't recall we ever did, did we? I think you need a, a roll call, right? Mm -hmm. Are you frozen? Uh, no. Um, so you open up the meeting and we'll state the time and then we do I roll did that call. Already. I did that already. Okay. Okay. <laughs> roll call has to be verbal. Okay. Um, so if I'll call your name and if you are present, please say so. Laurent Levy? Present. Cynthia Swopis? Here. Uh, Suzanne Smith? Here. And Joanne Levin, I'm here. Um, okay. Let's move on. Um, updates, uh, Cynthia, you are on the police commission. Um, do you want to tell us anything about that? Um, sure. There's no minutes. I'm just checking. There's no minutes. Oh, I know we have a little issue. Um, I didn't do minutes and okay. we'll, have, we'll have to talk about who might, oh, can someone take notes? Cause I'm willing to type the minutes but I can't run the meeting and take notes at the same time. If you can just take notes uh, like in an email or something like that and just send them to me, then I can type up the minutes. Who was, would someone be willing to do that? Um, sure. Uh, I'm sorry, is Kelly not taking minutes anymore? I just, I just need to get a... Yeah, that's what was proposed, right? Oh, okay, yeah. okay. She's been busy, yeah. Um, and, I, and I can supplement as well if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. And now, but now that you're going to be speaking, Lauren, do you want to take minutes on take notes yes. on what Cynthia has to say? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, Cynthia, you're on. Okay, so um, within seconds or maybe minutes, the final report is going to get dropped on the website. Um, <clears throat> we just can't seem to figure out if it's the police review commission <laughs> part or the mayor's part or city council, but that's all. It's imminent. Um, we submitted the report um, a few hours ago. So I'm just, you know, I'm just a little tiny hesitant until it really gets out there, but, but I'll just try to work around that um, and focus on <clears throat> um, how the Board of Health came up in the discussions and Can you just, the, just mentioned where it's going to be posted do you know on we don't know we're looking for it um, every minute but it's going to be on one of the pages of the website and i guess they're deciding how to do that so of the northampton city website correct right. yes yes okay. so it's about a 60 page report i hope you get a chance to read it um it was after six and a half months of over 60 meetings and over um, 12 hours of three public hearings. Um, so um, it was interesting to facilitate that when we had at times sometimes over 50 people. So, um, um, so it's been, a, it's been a, one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Um, and so just to set the stage a little bit, this uh, commission was um, appointed by the city council uh, and the mayor to review um, the Northampton Police Department um, in light of the recent killings in the summer of uh, George Floyd and Brianna Taylor. So um, 
our task was a little more specific than that, but that's the general gist of it. And so we've um, spent this time going through a lot of information from the police department, a lot of uh, research, a lot of testimony from the public. Um, I'll say, I'll say testimony that's pro and con meaning don't touch anything in the police department because we love it the way it is. And then you know, I had to categorize this as con, um, but individuals who are saying their safety <clears throat> is compromised and challenged and um, gave us some horrific stories, quite frankly, um, about encounters um, with the police department. So uh, in, um, let me give you the gist of, pull it up here on my iPad, uh, what the recommendations were. So um, what we tried to focus on is what are the activities that the police are doing now that may not require an armed response or an individual in uniform, um, which is basically the same thing. And, and we found many, 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 many things. Um, I actually spent two hours sitting with the dispatchers. We have an emergency dispatch department in the city that takes all incoming calls, and they're the ones who route them to 911. They're the ones who call the police to, to respond to a call. Um, so they take the medical emergency calls, they take the fire calls, they take every single call. It was just an amazing experience to watch these folks work um, and take in the calls. But um, we, um, the report will break out um, how the types of calls that come through, and they can be anything from, if I'll just highlight, um, the major call that is routed to the 911 number for an armed police officer to attend to um, are property checks. And property checks involve a wide range of things, anything from I'm going on vacation next week, can you drive by, to I think I see somebody in my yard. So it's, it's just that's the majority of things that... Um, the 911 calls are directed toward. <clears throat> so we uh, we identified all those things. I mean, there's things like fallen trees. Um, there's things like um, someone speeding. There's just, I would say maybe about 15 categories. <clears throat> um, so what we did is we tried to identify which ones of those can be um, um, responded to by an individual who is unarmed. And that individual can be something that's called a civilian advocate, a peer responder, um, uh, an individual with particular certification and training, um, particularly in de-escalation techniques um, because of the mental health issues that are in our community and the, and the calls that are often um, a foundation of a mental health issue and therefore potential crime can be committed or perceived to be committed. Um, so what that resulted in is us recommending, by the way, um, what we're recommending is absolutely nothing new in the country. There are many, many, many cities and towns that are doing this. Our closest friends, Brattleboro, Ithaca, um, Brookline just released a report. Um, so, um, we're actually, it was surprising to find out we were behind a bit in, in kind of responding to um, to these calls for review. So we, we are recommending a department, we're calling it a department of community care. Um, it can be also called elsewhere's department of safety. Um, but basically this is a new department in the city. And if you keep in mind, all departments need to be under the mayor. Correct me if I'm wrong anytime, Meredith. <laughs> um, so you can't just have a department out there. It's gotta be, all departments like this would be under the mayor. So the individual who heads up this department would report to the mayor. And this department would um, assume the responsibility of all these things that have been identified as um, um, uh, not requiring an armed presence. And so some of the things that I mentioned to you, some of them are a little slippery because once you get that 911 call, the police officer doesn't know what they're walking into. And it could be something dangerous um, it could be something that needed an individual to have some de-escalation de techniques. It could be a range of things. So we, we certainly want to acknowledge that. So some of the categories we put must have a police response, uh, police officer respond with a co-respondent. We call this individual co-respondent. Um, 
So departments like this are cropping up all over the country. Some are large, some are small, some are um, located in different um, um, branches in the, in the cities and towns. Um, but where the Board of Health comes in is that, and it's interesting to note that the CDC doesn't recognize violence as a health issue um, because of the way it's funded. And so um, it's funded by Congress and Congress said violence couldn't be in there. So that's kind of interesting, but we're looking at this um, as a health issue. And so that's where the Board of Health comes in. Um, so um, if, and let me just go back and say, there are a significant number of police calls that are the result of substance abuse, um, mental health issues, um, domestic violence, which, which police state law must respond to. Um, and so, so let me just lump it in a category of social issues that um, surprisingly enough, um, with all the social service agencies we have in our community, um, there's, there's quite a number of these issues and um, probably exacerbated by COVID. So where does the Board of Health come in? Well, um, some folks felt um, that the Board of Health has these um, powers, whatever we call them, where, where we are allowed to make policy on health. And so this would be a great place for this department to fall under. Um, I'm, I'll just say um, there wasn't a, um, um, I'm gonna say a strong knowledge of how the city works. And, and, you know, and in our recommendations, you almost see this kind of buried, you know, it was sort of like, we recommend this department to be under the Board of Health. <clears throat> I was a little concerned about that, um, throughout all the deliberations, I contacted Cheryl Sabara um, and um, just wanted to see, is that something that's going on? <laughs> is this something that's possible? And she's, her response to me was she was very intrigued by this. And she said, it is perfectly acceptable for this to happen, acceptable in the sense of um, yeah, if you put that under a Board of Health, then those same powers that a Board of Health has would be, um, um, would be applicable. So, um, I, you know, there's about 12 or 13 recommendations. Some of them get into budget issues. We, we are not, um, by the way, using the words defunding. We're not using the words abolition in the report. Um, we are trying to... Um, really respond to the idea of safety and, and um, in this report. And we know that many Northampton residents feel very, very safe and want things to stay the remain they are, have things remain the same. And as I said earlier, there are many that, that do not feel safe. So we wanted to just kind of work off of that premise. So, um, so let me stop there. I don't know if there's any questions. That's the... Uh, You'll see a lot of research. You'll see a lot of study and narrative in this particular report. Um, the commission members um, were a wide, wide range of individuals in the community. And um, um, I became co-chair after, um, sad to say, um, we lost uh, four female members on the commission. And um, what that did was it just changed the balance dramatically from uh, more men than women. We maintained the BIPOC representation that was required um, on the commission, but um, it became clear. I mean, one of the people that left was a woman of color who was our co-chair. And uh, so we really needed another co-chair. And then that's when I, I assumed that role. So it was co-chairing with Dan, Dan Kennedy, um, <clears throat> who's a community member, a person of color. So um, that was one of the, the hardest things for me to, as we all know, the female voice, um, we silence ourselves and it gets silenced. <laughs> and so to try to struggle with that and keep you know, somewhat of a balance at times was difficult. We put that in the report as a constraint. There were many constraints that we had um, in doing the job that we did. And you know, I just felt really, um, I thought it was really important to put that in as one of them. So 
Um, so let me stop there and just see if you have any other questions. I do have a question. So what was the board made of? What types of disciplines um, were, were people, where did they come from? And how yeah. were those listed on the board? Did they have people who worked for behavioral health or social service agencies actually sitting on this commission or people from police departments? Was, can you tell us how it was, uh, who sat on the board? Not who, but yeah. disciplines that comprised of I mean, the names will be revealed in our report, but not revealed. But um, they just have to remember that the city council appointed, we were originally 15 members. Um, so the city council um, appointed seven or eight of those and the mayor appointed the remaining remaining number. So I'll just give you a range of the folks and keeping in mind, it was over 50% um, BIPOC people of color. Um, so lawyer, doctor, professor, ACLU, individual worker. Um, some, I'm just cycling through in my mind here. Um, individual who's um, actually retired from CSO who has a lot of um, mental health experience. Um, another individual had a lot of um, counseling, grassroots campaign experience um, with mental health and peer to peer. Um, and I, um, uh, co community people who have done work in the community in a variety of capacities. Um, I can tell you that I have never ever met or heard of any of them except for one that I heard of. So I, I did not know who these people were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until, well, now I do. <laughs> Were they all Northampton residents? Yes, that was a requirement. requirement? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Meredith, do you have more questions? No, I'm good. Thank you, Lauren. I have a question. Um, so the power that is given to the Board of Health from the state, uh, I don't remember the language. I mean, there's definitely- yeah. Definitive language about um, you know sewer systems and food and like those kinds of details, but um, is there more general language that would be appropriate, appropriately used for this group? In terms of what Joanne, I'm trying to understand. I'm just trying to figure out you know where we get our power. Is there you know some kind of general language in the state regs that say, you know, you can do anything that has to do with the health, health and safety yes. or health. Yeah, yes. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's chapter 111, section 122, or section 131, either one of those, I think that gives us the authority. And, and um, you know, when I talk with Cheryl, she, she, you know, we couldn't sort of conceptualize. I mean, I don't know, Meredith, in your circles, if anyone, like, how would this work? You know, I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, and, and, and just keep in mind, this, this commission is making recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, we, will, we will have a co-meeting on March 30th with city council to um, discuss our report and we'll give a formal presentation of our report, but it just landed, you know, like within a few hours so, um, and I wanted to get back to what, um, I think Meredith, you asked about representation from the police department. There, there was no representation from the police department. And that's, um, I, I don't know how the representation qualifications were addressed by the mayor and the city council. We did have um, two meetings with Chief Casper um, and, um, which were in two of our subcommittees. I attended both of those. Um, and um, it was basically, we had specific questions for her, some clarifications. We had full access to uh, information in the police department. I felt very bad for her and a few other people because we just said, we want these statistics and, you know, um, and they provided them. Um, sometimes we had to ask questions about them because as you know, they're all coming from software 
that could be outdated or it's just like that, that, that notion of a suspicious call. Okay, there's something suspicious going on in my neighborhood. What we don't know is the disposition of that call, right? So how many suspicious calls resulted in an arrest? Let's say something like that. Um, but we have the rests, we have um, all that information um, and we um, dissected that. Wow. Cynthia, um, just one comment about the CDC situation. Um, it's more than just Congress not funding the violence work. Congress has forbidden CDC from working in this area. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's they are absolutely forbidden. They had a violence prevention unit that was disbanded and they were told you will not be doing this work again. Um, and that is 20 years ago and it has not changed. Whose administration was that? Do you remember? I think it was under Bush. I believe it was under Bush. It was a Republican Congress that made that decision. It wasn't the White House. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's within uh, funding legislation. Um, the, uh, first of all, um, thank you for participating in this such a difficult ta task, yet important task for our community and, and treating it with the seriousness you always do. Um, and if I'm saying something that was already discussed, I, I apologize ahead of time. The, the interventions that seem to have been arising in general from this discussion um, revolve around a, res a response. And if not an emergency response, it sounds certainly like an urgent response, um, which is not um, the type of duty that is central to what the health department does. This health department certainly responds, mm -hmm. but almost never on an emergency basis. Mm -hmm. And Except for now, <laughs> COVID. <laughs> well, but but that even that is is is. I, I'm, I don't want to speak for Meredith, but but it's it's not. You get a phone call and it's drop everything because someone is um, um, in danger. It, it, yeah, it, it, someone's in danger. Someone behaving in a, in in a manner that is alarming to someone, um, and there is the potential for danger. The health department doesn't really. Um, respond that urgently. Mm -hmm. There is an emergency response unit, is there not? Is it, is, aren't emergency um, functions more tied to, to fire and rescue and EMT? If it's medical, yeah. Okay, if it's medical. Yeah. So that to even establish a response capability is quite an undertaking. Mm -hmm be citywide. It seems to me that um, there's an argument to be made that that type of unit is better prepared to undertake um, an emergency response. Uh, and that unit is already closely aligned with the police response. Working across departments, from health department to police, and, and coordinating a response that is effective sounds to me like um, a very difficult task to do. So I, I don't know if it, it came up to link this to emergency services, emergency response, or not. But that, as you're talking about this, that's where my thinking goes. Yeah. I. Um... A uh, great point, Suzanne, and I, I have two responses to that. Um, um, the dispatch, the emergency, res the, the emergency dispatch center, which doesn't work under the police department, um, that individual works directly for the mayor, um, but happens to be housed in the fire department. Um, there, just as a premise, the woman who runs it is an amazing woman. Um, uh, their go-to is one thing. Their go-to is 911, please. They have no other go-tos. So they don't have, oh, there's, and they, they know a lot of people in town that call in that are regular callers. 
well, let me, let me call in this mental health professional and that'll help Mr. So-and-so to, you know, they do not have that option. So I, I give you that, you know, just as, and, and they, when we spoke with them, they're like, boy, we would love to have more options, but their only option right now is an armed response. Um, and so that's, that's kind of interesting in itself. And then another way to look at this is um, Hampshire Hope. Right, we we saw a need. We developed um, an amazing department that does do some responding prevention. I don't I don't know. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get Cherry to uh, we couldn't get her to have a conversation with her. But um, I don't know exactly how they respond. And I think that the premise of all of this is. Um, um, there are other people who could be trained and may be more trained um, than a police officer. And, and the police have told us a lot of their jobs are social issues. And so how do we tease that out? That's the challenge of a department of this nature. That is really the challenge. And so um, we talked about that a lot. Um, but what amazed me without giving away identities or anything, um, even when we had the chief in our Zoom meeting, um, there were some people that couldn't go they, because it triggered them to such a degree. And so, you know, I, it's just taking all this information in a context and responding to it. And so um, I began to think about when I get stopped for speeding, <laughs> I feel guilty, nervous, scared. I never thought about it that way before, but I am. I'm just like, and not that I have anything to be afraid of. So I just have to, you know, I have to give that that side of the story as well. So, but I, I know what you're saying. Um, um, getting into the weeds of this and how each call would be handled and what type of responder would be appropriate. We, there's a lot of research, research that says peer-to-peer -peer responses are amazingly effective. Um, one of the organizations, which Chief Casper has told us she, she is definitely aware of, is a, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, it's called Cahoots. It's out of Eugene, Oregon. They've been around for over 30 years. They are a mobile van that goes around Eugene, Oregon, and many, many calls go to them in their 30 year history. They have never, ever, ever had an act of violence. And so there are models out there that are doing this kind of work. So now where, where it sits in the city, that's the city's decision, certainly. I mean, it could be its own you know, department working under planning. I, I don't know, I don't know, but... Um, just to clarify, you had mentioned to me that there was a reason why the group was thinking that it should go under the Board of Health. Mm -hmm. And that's because we get the, our power mm -hmm. from the state and not directly from the mayor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason. And I can't, you know, I don't know how that reason would play out. I mean, I can't say, no, that isn't true. Um, <laughs> and so that was um, attractive, you know, but, but it was also, um, stifling for many members on this commission to hear that a department has got to be under the mayor. It's got to be under the executive branch. It can't be off on its own. It can't have civilian oversight. You know, it can't be community directed, et cetera. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I mean, it was, it was sort of more than a, su of a suggestion for people to think about, but um, um, so so the Board of Health has autonomy from the government, and there's mass general law that covers that. But under the new charter change in Northampton, the mayor now supervises in tandem with the Board of Health, the health director. But you have, as a board, complete autonomy, and so do all 351 boards of health. And the mission of boards of health and health departments is prevention. And I mean, we, we respond in nature to complaints and acts that we have to, but our number one goal and mission is all about prevention work, preventative work, pe prevention from people getting sick, whatever it may be. 
Hampshire Hope was born out of, um, and Hampshire Hope is all about prevention work, preventing people from getting addicted to substances, right? Hampshire Hope has gotten um, through all of the work and all of the grants and all of the expansion that we've done over the years has become this um, umbrella kind of covering all of the different tracks and programs that run out of this kind of division of the health department. And we're trying to straighten that out because Hampshire Hope is all about prevention. DART, which is an overdose <laughs> response, a comprehensive overdose response team is something completely separate and different from Hampshire Hope. Um, so that's kind of the only kind of um, response that I can think of in my department where there's some type of immediate reaction to a call coming in. But everything else we do is prevention based. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that Cherry couldn't attend one of your meetings, but she's been out for a bit, as you know. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that just so everyone who's listening understands the differences between Hampshire Hope and DART. And Meredith, just to, just to clarify, you report to both the mayor and to the board. Yes. Yeah. But you, uh, you have the authority to direct, hire, fire me. I do not think the, the mayor has the authority to do so. I just, um, I report to him. And that's an, an, a, a mass general law. Any other um, questions for Cynthia? Yes, so the, the first question is, so that I understand, was one of the recommendation be that this Department of Community Care, Department of Safety, be much like the health department, which is uh, the director reports to the mayor, but it's under the board, the, the oversight of the board? Um, a lot, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, who this department would report to, and there's a lot of um, constraints in the charter about that. I think um, I think the commission was attracted by the notion that there's this board, unlike the planning board, unlike the, I don't know what other boards we have that, that has this unique position. And, um, you know, health um, in all its spectrum was brought up quite a bit in, in, the, um, in the deliberations and comments and um, particularly mental health, and, and so and house houselessness. Not saying that that it in itself is a health issue, but can you know result in health issues, obviously. So um, it all so I think, affects. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And you know, I have always come from the perspective that health is everything. That's what I teach in my class. I mean, we just can't ignore this thing. <laughs> But how do you administer it through city government? And you know that's that's a whole nother story. And so uh, we didn't deliberate, quite frankly, a lot on that structure. There, there's definitely. Um, I mean, I'm just giving you a range of opinions here. You just have to read the reports and you see the final recommendations. But you know, people were adamant they did not want this anywhere near the police. Well, anywhere near. <laughs> you know, a traditional way of thinking of a Department of Community Care. Um, they didn't want it tied to anybody. They didn't want it tied to some of the many organizations we have in the city because those are uh, the, the, the social service agencies we have in the city because so many of them are grant funded and that's not sustainable. You know, they're, they're working off of one grant cycle to the next grant cycle. So, you know, the recommendation is, is that these folks are, whoever the, these individuals would be, that worked in this department, they would be city employees with a salary, with certification, with training, um, or primarily as, you know, as I said, in de-escalation. Um, and my second question is more out of curiosity is you mentioned that the dispatchers getting house check calls, um, is this through 911 or the non-emergency Northampton number? And does it lend to the same person anyway, except one is a green button, the other one a red button? Yeah, it's where, yeah. I mean, 
911 is is basically the, what the dispatch does is they answer the calls to the fire department and the police department all their business calls off hours too and the 911 calls so any emergency calls they don't do and I don't know who does 211 I'm sorry I just don't have that knowledge I, don't I, know if you do. I was under the impression the non non emergency number is a 413 you end I believe you end up I've never really, I don't recall ever calling 911 as much as calling the non-emergency number for mm -hmm. syringe or something like this. Yeah, it yeah. seems to be recorded and you seem to be connected to a dispatcher. Yes, yes. So that'd be the same thing? The dispatcher handles those calls? Because, I mean, calling 911 for a house check because you're going to be on vacation in the summer seems pretty obnoxious to me. But if there's a protocol to do that, Lauren, in the city then that's the protocol they have to follow. And they have some really, really strict protocol because they do have to protect themselves. And, you know, for routing a call in, a, in an um, not an appropriate manner. So uh, the way it's set up now is that the, you know, sort of the primary responder is going to be a, a police officer. So, so just to kind of circle back, so there is a non-emergency call that go a number that goes to dispatch, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. That's to my knowledge, there is. Yeah. And um, um and they refer to it as the business calls. Uh -huh. So you call the police department, right? But it's not really emergency. Mm -hmm. So it's not 911. I mean, that's the way I'm I'm understanding it. Mm -hmm. Did, the, did you guys discuss how uh, DVIP fits in with this domestic right. violence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, it's been, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'd like to hear because I, I, you call 911 and if it's a domestic violence call, they call DVIP. And I'm under, I, I think what I understand about it is they then dispatch someone that works for the DA's office to initiate a contact, no? Well, um, let me just say um, domestic violence calls are toxic. It's the number one place where a police officer is going to be harmed in the country. It's dangerous. Um, so the exact, and now I spoke with the woman who heads up um, um, the DVIP program in the DA's office. I've spoken to the woman who, who heads up. There's two civilian advocates that work out of our police department. And so when a domestic call come, domestic violence call comes in, and remember you sometimes you don't know it's a DV call. You know someone's being you don't know what right. what the situation is. So um, these two, and this is a grant. Um, these two individuals, females, they will never ever go on the call, never. They would be contacted after it has been determined a domestic violence um, incident has occurred. And then they will contact them to, to provide support and resources. So um, my thinking is, and I, to be really, really frank, um, domestic violence is a very difficult thing for this commission to address, mm -hmm. period, um, because it's so fraught, and and it, you know, you have a situation where if it's a female calling about maybe being abused, or, and she may not want a cop there because this a, a cop taking that individual away impacts her livelihood, her family, her kids, her you know, she may just want to be safe. It's so it's so complicated. You'll see us, we wrote, we wrote about it. We have a big section on it, um, but it, it's a tough one. It was a tough one for us to make any recommendation on because it's so volatile, it's so common and it's so toxic. And there are violent um, toxic situations involving mental health, health disorders. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think uh, obviously this is an incredibly difficult topic, um, but it's not like things fall in one pot or the other. Um, there's so much overlap between things for which you need mm -hmm. you need a, a trained police response and one for which perhaps a different type of professional 
would be better suited and you often don't know until after you get there. Right. Um, uh, I just wanted to, as, as someone who has to try to identify resources for people with mental health disorders um, and not a lot of resources themselves on a daily basis, uh, the shortage of people with any training in this area is, it, it, it's, it's a nightmare. And agencies like ServiceNet, CSO pay so poorly compared to um, other opportunities. There's such turnover in staff. Um, there is just not a pool of professionals in this area that would be prepared sufficiently to be trained in this area. It would essentially be growing a whole new um, category of public servant mm -hmm. to serve, which is no small undertaking. Which is one of the reasons why, you know, we were, we are um, proposing it be a city employee with the right type of training. I mean, a, a police is, a, police officers are trained to do certain things. And now their training, if you look at a list of their training has included so many of these uh, um, different social issues and, and how to treat, treat individuals that are, are living under these different social issues. And so that's a question too, you know, for safety and communities, like what do you want your police to do? And are there other people who are better, more qualified, can be focused differently um, than an individual who is there to protect, <laughs> you know, and we're all here to protect. I mean, we're all, they're just doing that every single day. It's beyond prevention too, but so um, yeah. And, um, but, I, you know, I'd, I'd be, a, I'm kind of a pragmatic person, but I'd be a little more skeptical if I hadn't seen the research and heard from, we, we brought the Cahoots people in from Eugene, Oregon, and heard about how they do their job. I mean, it's really, um, you know, we, you're going to see the word in our report, reimagine a lot, not divest, not abolish, but reimagine. And that's reimagine everybody would have to reimagine how, how we want in our community um, safety to be conducted. So. Thank you, Cynthia, so much. I can't believe that you took on this project and to be its co-chair. And that's just amazing, amazing work. Thank you. Um, I think we should move on. But by my last question is, where do you think, what do you think the process is going forward? So now that the report is public, what are the next steps, do you think? Well, we, we, we needed to get this in during the budget cycle. Um, there, there is a lot, of, um, um, a lot of folks pressing on city council right now. And so the next step is it should, if it didn't drop while we are having this conversation, it will momentarily somewhere, city council will read it. They'll continue to talk to folks and then we will have this meeting on March 30th where we will uh, give a presentation. They'll ask us questions, um, but then it, it goes right into, cause it, it's gonna have budgetary implications, you know, and we're putting out a challenging schedule. And we realize that. And I think city council realizes that too. Oh, Meredith, thank you. There were two city councilors on our commission. So we had those two fellows, Alex Jarrett and Michael Quinlan telling us, mm, I don't think the city works that way, <laughs> you know? And so, um, so I just remembered that. So I think it'll be in many city council meetings in the spring and then we'll see where it goes. It's, it's now in their hands. This again is, is is a recommendation. Thank you so much. That's just amazing, amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, proud to be there. It's um, more than you bargained for, I'm sure. It wasn't in the job description that Lawrence, <laughs> Lauren is going to tell <laughs> Thank you so much. Just really amazing and, and it was a volunteer position, yes? Um, yeah, yeah, the uncompensated volunteer position. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable amount of work. This and um, side, Cynthia, you've really kind of taken a few for the team. No, but Meredith, <laughs> I'm looking at Joanne's graphic above her and behind her, and you've, uh, you're the team. <laughs> yeah. So, so on that note, now. 
Yes. Yeah. On that note, um, Meredith, do you want to give us an update? I thought we were going to go to the um, job description for the Board of Health me member. The oh, on section. our on our on our agenda, you're up. Yeah, Clark. Um, uh, so I sent the job the updated job description that I believe Laurent and Cynthia might have worked on after our last meeting, and I sent it to um, Clark, who works for CES, who presented a few months back. And she made some comments and I sent it, or Kelly sent it out to you. So who is this person who made the edits? So formerly known as Sarah Burkhart, oh, Bankhart. Um, now Clark Banker, I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, but we, we asked if she would make some recommendations and Kelly, if you can if, chime in, did you send the version to the Board of Health with the comments? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it okay. was attached to the document with the link. Laura, do you want to bring it up so we can look at it? Yes. Share your screen. That's why I made him co-host. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need another put responsibility. <laughs> you put me on this spot right here. Okay, let me see. Ta -ta. You gotta find it first and then I'll share it. Let me open it. Okay. And then I got to share my screen. Oops. And I need to share my desktop and I need to find the file that it just opened. I'm there just it is, we see it. Can you see it? Yep. Perfect. Can we see the comments though? Yes, let me see. And I, I apologize, this is, I do not have Word on my Mac. Mm. Ah. I, this software I don't use as often, but I believe we can see the comment. Oh, there, there we go. Can you, can you see that? So yeah. that's the first comment. Um, and, and I think they, they all make sense. Um, so let's see what it says. Consider adding a statement up front that welcomes people to learn about the board. Think of it as a job posting. You're marketing the board to prospective applicants. If you're hoping to appeal to people who might be interested and qualified, but perhaps a bit hesitant, conveying a sense of welcome up front could be helpful. Some organization have crafted welcoming statements that include welcoming people's identities and seeing them as a source of strength. So I, I wonder whether that sentence means you can find some canned language ready to cut and paste, <laughs> but I don't know if you guys can think of something in your organization. I can certainly look within my professional organization whether we have something of that nature because I know um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I just, yep. want to, I just want to make sure I understand what it means uh, to say that the welcoming statements should include welcoming people's identities and seeing them as a source of strength. Welcoming people to identify themselves is about certain characteristics or uh, I, I'm not clear as to what that means. Um, how, how, how that would be incorporated into the beginning of this, um, this document. I, as I understand, I, I don't know, I mean, if, I'm, I'm happy to answer. As, as I sing this through, I think there could be a one or two sentences, just simply that's not immediately focused on what the board does as much as the importance of the, that the board has to, um, to be, uh, they primarily one that's seeking diversity within the organization that they're interested in. Well, I, I think it's also a, um, I don't want to say catchphrase, but that's all that's coming 
to me where people who are assuming certain identities now, um, and that that's a, a wide range and people are um, um, strongly wedded to a particular identity, something that we didn't see before, but we're seeing that now. Um, so whether that's yeah. ident identity of gender or identity of color or identity of neurodiversity, um, that's, um, that's a catchphrase right now. And one who has and identifies in that way and uses that language um, um, would be, would get it, you know, maybe more so than some of us. I don't know. You're, Suzanne, you're muted. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of um, those particular diversities. I'm, I, I guess beyond, uh, maybe this, maybe this is as simple as expanding the statement about how um, if there's something in here about you know people of, of diverse backgrounds or underrepresented groups are welcomed maybe this just means expanding upon that in some way um, that's why I wasn't clear um, whether this was just a simple expansion of terms diversity or whether something else was indicated that I wasn't understanding. Should we continue? Yes. Second comment. This is essentially the mission statement of the board. Is there anything else to provide here that anchors the board's work? Values, for example, equity statement, anything else you can provide here to help people understand how the board orients to public health might bring it more alive to, for a prospective applicant. Oh, that's a tough one, but I'm sure we can come up with something collectively. Mm -hmm. So the quality of life, it's, I, I can't, with the comment there, I can't see the um, first sentence, but the quality of life has been the catchphrase for 40 years, you know, uh, as what a board of health does, improves the quality of life. I really feel like if we broke that down, we could come up with something that was extremely meaningful and embed into that health equity, that piece that we're looking for. Or would um, the characterization of health as a human right be helpful here? And that's a, it's our job to protect those rights? That sounds good. That's good. And we had a diversity statement uh, that we came up with a few weeks ago that we were going to include. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that actually got in here. Um, we had sort of three statements that uh, about what we were going to do about diversity. Do you remember? I think Laurent, mm -hmm. I think you, you finalized those. And I don't know if those got in this uh, document. You know, I probably took a look, but it doesn't hurt for me to double check that and to ensure that <laughs> we, uh, these, those things don't uh, exist independently. So I'll take another look. So diversity of identities is one thing we're interested in for sure. Um, but I think on a just more straight ahead um, um, issue when people think about joining the Board of Health, when they look at who's currently on the Board of Health. When I, I noticed this when I wrote that letter to the editor the other day, we all have advanced degrees. Um, and I don't know if we want to be more clear about what kind of education or background that people might have that might be appropriate for the Board of Health. Um, we can look at who served before um, and brainstorm about what kind of different kinds of backgrounds as far as work and um, knowledge would be diversifying for the board. Um, 
as well. So I, I, I recall um, I, I recall being concerned about all those letters after our names and, and uh, particularly the question that I remember getting when I posted this on the Facebook is, do I need to be a physician or health professional? And the answer is, is no, since half the board isn't um, right now. And I don't think uh, Bill was a health professional either. He worked for OSHA. Um, so that's- uh, that's, a, I, I, that's a health professional. Say again. Uh, OSHA, it, he is a health professional. Um, that's a, working for OSHA. Yeah, it's, I it's, suppose. It's I suppose you're. I suppose to write safety and health. <laughs> yes, you're right. I suppose. <laughs> I suppose that makes it. I, <laughs> I suppose, but don't you? Wouldn't you associate if, if I, at least in the, you know, if if someone had to give you an example of health professional is working for OSHA, the first thing that you come up. With? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty. Well, I mean, this is this is not the time for it, but there are entire um, um, organizations at CDC and and in Washington that are that are focused on occupational health. And so I guess I do include and he's also he's also was quite skilled, uh, skilled in environmental assessments, um, an area that's pretty central to a lot of health. So I, I think he was extremely well qualified in that sense. I mean, maybe that that type of expansive definition of health is is something that we need to think more of as we're as we're working on this. It's not just smoking regulations, yeah, and and COVID vaccine. I mean, Meredith in the past had you know said you know do we want someone from the business community? I mean, really might want to put out some examples of really diverse backgrounds, not identities, personal identities, but work identities. Um, and and what kind of education or training would be acceptable? I mean, really just sort of put it out there. I mean, show the diversity. I mean, right now we're not that diverse a group um, as far as our background, but, um, or educational level, so um, yeah. What, what I meant to say is um, I, I did specifically add language, but perhaps it needs to be reinforced that you didn't need to be a physician or a medical professional to be on the board. That's, that's right here. Do you need to have a higher, you know, what kind of education are we looking for? What kind of, do you need to have a, you know, what kind of degrees are acceptable? I think, I think spelling it out would be, help people be more clear um about what qualifications they need or don't need so in the statute there's there's two things that need to be met one there needs to be a physician on the board two you have to live in the town or city right so that's saying you don't need qualification once you have your physician mm -hmm. the only qualification is being a resident so it's mm -hmm. almost it's it's almost I mean, if, if people are being intimidated by letters, the point is to say, you don't need a qualification. You, right. well, you don't need mm -hmm. um, a, a degree uh, to be part of this board. Then I think we should say that um, or an advanced degree or, you know, whatever, however we want to say that. Um, it just it just goes into a little more detail and and making people who don't have an advanced degree more comfortable with that. But I'm also I'm also wondering if we we need to address amongst ourselves um, where our gaps are, if we have any. I think we've acknowledged there's a gap of diversity, and right. so. Um, you know, are there any other gaps and how do we, you know, we focus more on what the gaps are and then how to attract those as opposed to um, throwing out a much wider net. Because it's, it's, it's problematic because we kind of, I don't want to say take who we get, but, you know, the application pool isn't very big. <laughs> um, well, it may be not big for the reason that they think they have to be you know, yeah. highly educated, um, you know, public health professional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, this is not, 
a position where um, there's a lot of opportunity to train if you don't already have some basic knowledge of health and um, what public health means. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's attending the board meetings and, and perhaps MAHB training opportunities and anything you might take on yourself, but someone who has no background in anything health related, um, I, I think would have a, I'm not saying it's impossible, I think it would be difficult um, to participate in, in a full way, certainly at least for a while, um, because there's a, there's a lot that we discuss and a lot that's going on that does require a certain level of expertise in a variety of areas. Well, except for Cynthia, um, I mean, I certainly was not an expert in public health and individual health is like a totally different animal. And when I came on the board, I found the thing that was really difficult and different for me was understanding government and how yeah. government mm -hmm. works. Um, but, and that was sort of on the job training and I still don't get a lot of it. Um, but I mean, I, my medical background ha helps in certain areas, you know, when we talk about vaccination or whatever, but in so many other areas it is just not related. Um, and it's really understanding processes and, and sort of the ability to think, I mean, you know, and to be strategic and to understand the issues more than what my medical background brings to me. But I think there's something here to be said. It's, um, we, it's, it's important that we don't have all the same training. I'm not gonna start second guessing on uh, viruses and medications because I don't have a medical degree. I probably will start defending myself if we're talking about environmental assessment and certain types of chemicals. And, but I think the, the point here is that we, we need someone who can provide skills that none of us have. And perhaps, you know, the point of someone like Bill that he was seeing things from the OSHA perspective. And Those are a voice. I mean, a voice too. Like yeah. Joanne said, like I always wanted, I felt like at one point our board was definitely um, medical heavy and having someone from the business community or I mean, is important. We want to be well-rounded and well-versed to speak of all of the aspects of the jobs and the policies that we make and do. I mean, I, I, I think of health disparities when we talk about this. I mean, mm -hmm. all of us um, have access to health. Right. And um, having probably insurance and to some degree a means and the knowledge to kind of push back at a doc if one needed to. So it's, um, as, just... as, I, as I look back, the times where I believe we've sat in meetings and been surprised by the input in the public comment sessions were often from the business community in one way or another whether it was during the smoking discussions, whether it was way back in the tattoo um, parlor discussions, our regulations um, very strongly, our, our prevention efforts, our programs are more community wide, but the regulatory, the regulatory component of what we do, which is very important, often disproportionately affects the business community. And I think there have been times I can think of where what was raised in the public comment sections was not something that had been part of our discussion up to that point. So if I'll say from my, from my own perspective, it was a blind spot. So as, as I think about this, um, not in any way to, um, uh, um, diminish the importance of uh, more diversity, um, but 
let's not forget that we have this big regulatory component and there's a section of the community that's affected by that and we don't hear from them until we've spent a lot of time trying to intuit it ourselves and, and sometimes missing it completely. Should we go on? Uh, yes, this was the third comment. Third comment was whether there was an age requirement, and I don't believe there is based on what Meredith said. As long as you're a Northampton resident, you could be, I assume 18, but I don't know, maybe not. Hmm. I mean, could you have a high school student? You know, I don't know. I don't think the Mass General Law speaks to that, but perhaps the city charter does. So, because they have lots of boards and commissions. We can look into that. Although, <laughs> I think anything less than 16, I'm not supposed, I'm, I'm not suggesting, but, but at least some, you know, some familiarity with scientific literature and you know, making distinction between what science and public, you know, peer reviewed journal publication and so on. I think it takes at least a college, I mean, having gone to college, but um, I, I don't know what you guys think. Um, the next comment was, would it be helpful to name the groups? Because I, I, it's true that um, people may not know that they are considered to be underrepresented. Another mm -hmm. thing to consider would be to list some of the skills that you think would be especially important to add to the group. And, and I, 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 to be perfectly honest, I avoided uh, naming the underrepresented groups because I was afraid of missing one. <laughs> so I figured if I'm not going to spell them out, um, uh, I, I leave it up to the reader to figure out whether they consider themselves underrepresented. Um, mm -hmm. And th that's why, and I'm a little bit nervous to do this, um, yeah. but would you want to name underrepresented groups? So maybe the best way to go about that is name the represented demographic on our board, like take the census of the city of Northampton and spell out that that demographic is certainly represented. I don't know. I'm just because hmm. I too would hate to omit someone, right? Well, would we start by saying that men are underrepresented because I represent 25% of right. the board? Right. That's, <laughs> that seems a little bit. I agree though. And to but... Suzanne's point, the businesses are under, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, you could carry that literal definition. Um, so I think Meredith, yeah, I would agree trying to list this out. That's why I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of advocating for this gap analysis. Like, what do we think we need? Well, mm -hmm. Suzanne says we, we need a business person. And then, well, do we need a, a, someone from the youth commission or do we need someone representing a health disparity, you know, mm -hmm. and put them all in. Mm -hmm. What, what do we think we want or need? I, I don't know. Well, then we have to leave, Cynthia, because there aren't <laughs> enough spots for all those <laughs> so In addition to what we said, we need a physician, we need public health, we need... Um, we're, we're putting an awful lot on one person that needs to fill all those slots. And in some way, you could say what's underrepresented is someone, because we all have advanced degrees, so we need someone who doesn't have a college education, yeah. which essentially goes totally against what I've said it might <laughs> two minutes ago. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I idea, think, yeah. no, I think we could say we're looking for diversity in identity. I don't know if that's vague enough. Mm -hmm. uh, education, background, um, previous oh. work experience. I mean, we can just put it out there that we're looking for diversity in many areas. Um, um, but if we want to do a gap analysis and really we're, figure out who we want, that could be for if we have multiple candidates, which of those candidates might look more attractive to us. But I don't know if we want to put that in the job description here. Um, and we never get to weigh in on that. 
You know, yes. we're, we're told who the next person is going to be. Um, is there a way to um, make this more sales oriented? Like, you know, are you concerned about the health of people in Northampton? Have you ever mm -hmm. thought that um, um, you had some ideas about how we could make uh, Northampton a better place, a healthier place? Um, do, do you do you use the bike path? Have you participated in the COVID vaccine program? Things like that that people might not appreciate as being under our rubric. But like, do you have it? Rather than we think you ought to fit this box in this box. Like, hey, out there, people, do you care about this? If you care about this, we the city really needs you. We. we I we need, you, we need your input. We need you to help. We're, we're asking for people to help who have a real enthusiasm and interest about health and well-being. And, um, and if COVID hasn't stirred your interest mm. in how important these issues are, nothing will. But as a cautionary tale, we also don't want people to come in with personal agendas. Got, I understood. I was trying to get the information. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just trying to reframe it. And how could, yeah. what could we do? People don't even understand what the health department is and what it is that we do. So I like the direction and the process that you're going through, but just reframing a little bit. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. It, that, that's why I, I. That's why I was this listing a number of different right. things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not, not. Hey, do, did COVID piss you off? Well, we, you know, we need you on the board. Not something. Right, like right, right. That. Mm -hmm. that also could be something that we put out as sort of a, you know, a letter, a call, whatever. And then this is more the informational thing that's attached to mm -hmm. it. So we could have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, is there are any other comments on there? Yes, there is one last comment. That's an interesting one, actually, which is, would it be appropriate to include a section on how someone would be supported coming into the position? Is there orientation, ability to learn from other members? I'm not sure what's legally allowed, so I can't provide a whole lot of suggestions. But again, thinking of someone who might be interested and qualified but hesitant, seeing that they would be able to get support to orient to the role might be reassuring. And that's interesting because in some way, the public meetings law do prevent us from some sort of mentoring. Um, you know, does, not never prevent, really... does not Go prevent ahead. two people oh, from talking that's right. together. So I had envisioned that if someone new came in, they would just be assigned or, or choose someone and that would be their mentor. But yeah. that's how yeah. I imagined it. And they can also learn from Meredith. I mean, and then it's the MAHB. And I mean, I think all of us have learned on the job. There, there's probably a better way to do it, but yes. at least um, having a mentor, um, one person is allowed um, by open meeting law. And I, you know, it, it makes me think about um, attending the MAHB training sessions, whatever. There was never a report. I don't think a requirement to do that, but for someone who may not be in this world and with this language, that would be, you know, I would recommend you'd have to have the ability to attend these sessions, you know? Mm -hmm. I have to say when I went to my first MAHB meeting, which was probably shortly after I joined the board, I was totally overwhelmed by it. I mean, they just jump into assuming you know all kinds of stuff yeah. it really yeah. wasn't not an introductory kind of course it was like you know a lot of the people there were in public health for many years and there's uh what's his name oh i can't remember his name Charlie. yeah Charlie Kanicki. yeah Charlie. yeah Kanicki, <laughs> right talking about all kinds of stuff that i had no clue what they were talking about and by the end of the day i was totally overwhelmed sort of getting the hang of a little bit of like how government works, but like that was not a one-on-one kind of course. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, Joanne, I, I felt the same way and we're quote unquote educated. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I think we really have got to build, build that in the mentorship piece, the training mm -hmm. piece, the, you know? Yeah, I mean, 
the um the what was it the open meeting law thing that you have to go through this long long yeah. process that was eye opening that was a real in in um introduction to government and how government happens and all the minute kind of regulations that can occur. And that was mind boggling as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, and then, then I read the state regulations, uh, but I, you know, I could be a mentor and go and I, I'd learn a lot or, you know, one of us or Meredith could go over those state regulations, like here are the rules that we need to abide by. And this is where we get our power. And, and Melissa, we could, we could come up with, with a training program that we could contribute to. And, and Melissa created those binders that has everything that you're talking about in there. It's kind of like the onboarding process, but here's a binder, read it and figure it out for yourself. Yeah. But if we can add on to it, and unfortunately, it hasn't been updated probably in a year and a half, if anything new has, has happened in between. Um, but I think it's a really good foundation to build off on, like all the state, all the local regulations, the MHB um, course syllabus, I think, is in there. Um, so, yeah, at least there's that. I don't know how often they're running that. MHB um, training anymore. I don't. I haven't seen it come across, you know, any of my emails in since COVID. I think, yeah, I remember going to the one in uh, in October twenty nine. When was it? Twenty nineteen. Then okay, I went to because I went to the. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, they were doing, they were doing them at least once. Well, when I started way back when they were twice a year, one in Eastern Mass, one in Western Mass, and then they scaled it down a bit to once a year. And it was like every two years in Eastern Mass, then one year Western Mass and alternating that way. But I haven't seen anything of its kind since pre-COVID. But it's yeah. really not a 101, I'm new to this course at all. No. It's a no. jump right in and like, ah huge umbrella yeah. like you're in charge of all this here you go call me if you need me <laughs> well I anyway think i think we could we could come up with some kind of mentoring that includes reviewing the laws and reviewing um the the things that we have enacted and what the issues were around them and and, and some kind of we, we could come up with something so um, I'm trying to see what would be the best way to proceed with the revisions. Uh, do you want Cynthia and I to take a first pass? Do you want to look at this document? Well, you have it in your documents and provide some input. Um, and by this, I mean Susan and 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 uh, and Joanne. Or you want to uh, um, you want us to uh, draft, take another pass at it first, and then rerun it. What do you want to do? I, I personally could go either way. If you, if you have something, you, you're burning to provide some comments, by all means, go for it and send it to us through Meredith and we'll pick it up from here. If you rather wait to see the next iterations, um, I'm, I'm happy to work with Cynthia and take care of it. All right, I'll think about sending along some comments. And Suzanne, if you have uh, something you want to send to Meredith, then um... I, I, I can do that. OK. Thank you both so much for working on this. I know, Cynthia, I can't believe it. You have so much on your plate already. Well, um, I'm, I'm free now, but it, I, I, did have, I do have to admit that I just remembered I was taking minutes on this section. I'm sorry, I've actually only, taking taking minutes all along. I'm taking only, only three minutes ago. But um, so just to clarify, um, anyone who has comments, send to Meredith, and then Meredith will send to Laurent and I, mm -hmm. and we will take another stab at it. Is that yes. so? Okay. Just please send the comments to Kelly. Ah, Kelly. Okay. Yes, Kelly's uh, holding down the office. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> Meredith is busy. Okay. Sometimes I'm just thinking it might be just as easy to go through the list of 28,000 residents of Northampton <laughs> <laughs> and pick and start, start finding the, the, the short list of five people that we're going to beg to come and join our board. I just have one quick question for Cynthia. Are you busier now than when you worked for pay? <laughs> 
Well, I teach, right? So. <laughs> well, you still teach. Okay. Well, you, you have a lot of unpaid jobs now. So, but I get paid to teach. <laughs> <laughs> All Good right. question. Let me ponder that. Um, so uh, next on our agenda is just a question about who's going to take minutes and I will write minutes. If you guys have any notes that you took that you want to send along, please send them to Kelly, but I will write minutes for this meeting. Um, if anyone has minutes or notes that they took for the last meeting, could you also send them along? Because I have not had access to my study because my daughter is in there. So I, I'm not sure how many notes I have. It's also recorded, so I can send you the recording. Lauren, can you unshare your screen? Yes, before you get all the family communication. <laughs> <laughs> they clearly, they're You're not going to bed. read French. Like we saw something come up on WhatsApp. <laughs> it's, my, it's my mother seems to not go to bed until, you know, 1 a.m. <laughs> now we know you're qualified to be on the Board of Health. <laughs> okay, and just to finish up, uh, Meredith, do you want to give us um, uh, an update of where you are? Uh, yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're still you're still awake. You're still standing. <laughs> still standing. Yep. So why don't I just kind of give you an overview of where we're at in Northampton. Um, so today, well, as of yesterday, this is current, this information. We've had a total of 1,192 COVID cases for Northampton residents since um, March 12th, I think was our first case, if I remember correctly, of last year. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say about 65% of those cases have been from December to March right now. Um, our total count for March is, oh, geez, it says over 60. I don't have the exact number because I did this the other day. For, over this, for this month? For this month, for March. So yeah, 18 days, we've had over 60 cases. Um, February, we had 153. January, we had 272, which was our peak. December, 205, November, 100. And then it was just minute amounts of cases from mm -hmm. October to right. August, where the summer we had zero cases. Our, during the peak, our highest percent positivity rate was 3.36. And that was right around um, the second week of January. And our daily average average incident rate was 9.43, again, around the same time. I call Northampton's peak when I look at our graph, which is on the website, from the 2nd of January to January 23rd. That's when we were seeing our highest percent positivity rates, our average uh, daily rate, and 14-day uh, average per 100,000 incident rate all happened within that time. And that coincides with the rest of the country, what they're seeing everywhere else. It varies probably by a few weeks here and there, depending on what data set that you're looking at, but it pretty much dives all in the same. We're still getting a pretty significant amount of cases in Northampton, which is surprising to me. If you look at all of the national data and the state data, we People, some people are calling it a plateau, but I, I call it a slow decline. Northampton is still kind of, um, I don't want to say we, we're not really declining over the past three weeks. Um, we're not increasing at a significant rate, but we're also not plateauing. We're still getting um, enough cases where I don't know where to put it, what category to put it in. Um, we're seeing a lot of workplace exposures over the last two weeks, workplace outbreaks in the last two weeks still. Um, and again, this might not have a direct effect on Northampton's numbers because they don't live in Northampton, but we have establishments that have seven plus positive people um, within their operation, which could preclude to, you know, 20, 30 close contacts. So, there is still a lot of activity that's happening here and a lot of contact tracing that's happening with my, my nurses um, and et cetera. Meredith, can I just ask you what yeah. the category of those workplaces are? Restaurants, so, 
factories? Um, so a lot of um, daycare providers, we've seen activity there. Restaurants, we're still seeing activity. We've had some um, some cases, but not clusters in the school environment and then higher education. We've had yeah. some. Mm -hmm. And the last one was what? Higher education. So Smith Vogue has okay. been active over the past three weeks too. We had, um, there was a workplace, uh, um, um, a staff outbreak. It wasn't with the students. And then we've had a few students that were positive since, but that weren't related. So it wasn't part of the cluster. So yeah, but daycares definitely um, are on the, are, are trending. And that coincides with the state cluster data reporting too. So if you look at the weekly report from the state, it's long-term healthcare facilities, households obviously is number one, long-term healthcare facilities, senior living, um, higher, uh, education, um, daycares, and I think recreational and sports was like the sixth one down. I haven't looked at it in over a week, but it kind of coincides with what we're seeing here locally. And then restaurants. So it's still really busy, even though we're trending in the right direction, most certainly. Um, a lot of our time is spent at the vaccine clinic, as you know. Um, we're operating pretty much six days a week. We're trying to take Sundays off, most Sundays off. We're not, and I don't know if when we last met, um, I, if we had the designation as an approved DPH regional site. Yeah. We did back then, okay. I thought so, so but I don't, I don't. Okay, um, so with that um, becoming an, a, an approved regional site, we had to, we had to meet certain men, uh, benchmarks, which the state provided, meaning a certain throughput, number of vaccines per day, number of days of the week that you're operating using the state system, reporting to MIS, having a third party insurance company, taking anyone from the state of Massachusetts and all eligibility groups. And there was a few other benchmarks that need to be met in order to even put a proposal in. So, um, you know, we, we put this proposal in, we got approved on whatever the 22nd or 23rd of February, and it was supposed to be effective um, March 1st. So March 1st comes along, we are now this regional designated DPH site we expected there to be more vaccine to come with this designation. And I didn't expect the amount of vaccine that we put into our proposal because I know that you know supply is limited on the state level, but I did expect some ramping up of vaccine and that hasn't happened. So what has happened is we're now this regional site and we've had to open up instead of just serving perhaps Northampton and Hampshire County, we now have are receiving the same allocation that we were receiving pre-designation, so in February. So let's just call it one flat of Pfizer, which is 1,170 doses, if you get the right equipment, okay? So we're receiving 1,170 first doses, which we were receiving pre-March 1st, but now I have to share that with our satellite site in Amherst and now I have to be open to the entire state of Massachusetts, to the entire eligibility group. When it was just the city of Northampton vaccine site, I could pick and choose who would get vaccinated. I had to op be open to the eligibility groups, but it could have just been the city of Northampton or Hampshire County. So our capacity uh, in terms of vaccine has really diminished in this region in Hampshire County and in Western Massachusetts because of this designation. Huh. I think the vaccine availability is about to, um, you're about to get more like in the next week or two, I think it'll open up. But yeah, Dr. Levin, I've, I've seen it go up incrementally week by week, but we have not received one more dose in Hampshire County. In fact, Hampshire County per capita is the county that has received the lowest amount of vaccine over the all of the counties in the state. And it's not just by a margin. It is dis disproportional. If you look at the other counties on what they've received per capita, I think Berkshire County has received 50% per, by per capita. 
we've received 22 or 23%. Franklin County was 34%. I mean, look at that map. Is What's Joe that Comerford, about? Is Joe Comerford aware of this? Oh yeah. She is most certainly aware of this. What's the rationale? Is that because of, is this based on density of population or is it? No, just, it's based on per, per capita. So I don't know why Hampshire County is getting less than the other. Yeah, but it wouldn't make sense that if you're in the, if you're a, a county in the Boston area where there's an expectation, there's a more, it's per capita, I suppose. But even if it's per capita, if it's a very large county with uh, smaller amounts of people in groups, uh, or in public transportation, would, does this make sense or, or it's just totally unfair in essence? I can't answer that. And you cannot, um, because of this status, and I want to correct my earlier statement, you told us about it at the last meeting and then I think we got it the next day. You told us you were proposing it, but um, because we're in this status, you cannot say, I'm only going to do my 65s and over. Yeah. You have got to take anyone who applies through the system. No, no, no. Eligibility group, she has to do what the state says. But as far right. as like area of residence, she can't say, I'm only at Vaccinate Hampshire County. Right. They can have but, someone from Boston who's looking for a spot come to Northampton. So that's Which happens. We have many people out of the Western Mass zip code that come to our site. Right. Um, what so, I can do which is interesting, and this just came out two weeks ago, is I can take 25% of my vaccine allocation and keep it in the region. So, so that? That, that's brand new. Um, it's not a lot. It's, I mean, it's like 280 doses after I give Amherst their allocation that I can keep for a regional effort. So whether it's, you know, someone in Hampshire County 70 and above, like I can, I can really, I've been, so th these past two weeks, that's what I've been doing. Like totally focusing on the elderly in Hampshire County with the councils on aging. Sorry, let me just, I have to excuse myself for one second. You're fine. Sorry, I have a puppy. <laughs> um, are, are you experiencing the same nightmare hellish thing where appointments got canceled? Oh. Uh, as recent as two weeks ago. Or 10 days ago and people can't get through the website and your phone is off the hook are you still experiencing that oh it so it's it's not as much as it was a couple weeks ago um we and we've increased the number of warm bodies that are helping you know return phone calls take the messages off the machines at some at one point um within a three three week period, we had over 1700 messages that we had to return. So, I mean, so um, there, there's been a reduction, like Mass 211 is working better, which is then taking some of the heat off of us locally. We've been working with our Hampshire County communities on getting, you know, call centers set up in their communities. Not all of them have done it, but maybe a half a dozen, which again has taken some of the heat off of us. But there are so many obstacles that are out of our control that is making this process harder than it has to be. And, you know, obviously one was the state registration system. Um, PrepMod itself using it in clinics has just it, it, it's very very challenging and every single day we're faced with something new um this week just this is an example that I spent two of my last days on trying to fix they sent us for our ancillary supplies they sent us generic needles and syringes and 50 percent of them were bent or crooked um a good few of them the tips the points were broken off um, some of them were blocked. So when you pulled them out, they automatically retract back in. Um, they were suboptimal. And the ones that we could use, we had a good portion of people actually bleeding at the injection site because they were so dull. Oh. So this came, so this was yesterday. We opened up our clinic at nine o'clock. I was informed of this by 9.50. 
I put in an email and a call to the upper echelon of DPH and the COVID command center. And it said in the subject line, urgent, immediate attention required, you know, and I didn't get a response. At 2.45, I said, hate to be a pain in the butt. I need a response now because these needles that they sent us weren't doing the job. And so we had, we ended up finding some needles at um, Western New England University that we could borrow. But I, I called everywhere. Nobody has great syringes or needles, you know. It's just, it, there's just always something. There can never yeah. be a day that's just fluid and um, fire free. Like we're, we're always putting out fires all day long for things that the state has handed to us. Do, do you think, because I know partners started to offer the vaccine and they're giving a lot of vaccines to patients who have a partner's doctor or a cool mm -hmm. dick doc. Is that taking some of the pressure off maybe? I believe so. I mean, they yeah. started, Joanne could probably speak to this, but I know last week, they last Saturday, they gave out 698 doses and they're going to be offering vaccines three days a week. So... Yeah, I mean, I think it's still really hard to get an appointment at the senior center. I mean, those those that uh, those clinics go up and they're gone. You know, I think within minutes. Minutes. Mm -hmm. um, by partners, you have to be invited, and there's yeah. still those spots go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know someone who was invited who only could find a spot in you know, in Somerville or something. Like it, it's it's you know, none of the systems are working well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, th you know, uh, unfortunately. Fortunately or unfortunately, the state has, you know, you, you heard that they now put out the timeline about when the new eligibility groups are up. And that doesn't just say, say whether the previous eligibility group actually got access mm -hmm. and, right. um, mm -hmm. and whether there's adequate vaccine. And so it's just going to continue to be a dog eat dog process for everybody. It it's, absolutely is. And they give us no warning. Like, if yeah. we're notified an hour before they do a press release of the new eligibility groups, we're usually finding out at the clinic because the public is telling us because we're not obviously when we're at the clinic looking at our emails all day long. There is no prior notification when the state is doing something like that. Um, yeah, there are lots of challenges. We, um, as of last Friday, don't have, we, we're only doing it once a week, getting our data report. But as of last Friday, we did about 12,500 vaccines out of our, our clinic here in, at the Northampton Senior Center. Um, 8,236 of them were first doses, 3,990 of them were second doses. So we're having an impact in Western Massachusetts for sure. You know, we are seeing obviously zip codes, like I said, from Eastern Mass, but I think it's a, a small enough amount where it's really not impacting the residents of Western Massachusetts enough. Um, if I if I were to guess, and maybe maximum. Um, so, but we're doing a really good job. The operation itself, anyone that comes to operation would never know that we're putting out fires all day long. Um, very few times has anyone had to wait any longer than 10 to 15 minutes after their scheduled appointment time to actually get in the room to be vaccinated. So it is a well-run machine. And again, yeah. we're, ready, we're ready to ramp up. Last Saturday, we did 540 or 60 doses, um, which is fantastic. That was our highest throughput to date. But again, we could do 900 easily. We're doing 460 with our eyes closed now. Like it, it's that, the system is that good. Everything is in place that should be in place. Um, in terms of Northampton residents, the report that came out from DPH, because they now do a weekly vaccine report, um, 7,411 Northampton residents have received their first dose, and then 4,518 residents are fully vaccinated, meaning they either receive their second dose and or a first dose of J&J, &J, which is the only dose that you need for J&J. &J. And we're going to breach probably tomorrow, 
It'll be announced when we've reached the million marker of people vaccinated in Massachusetts, which is a huge feat in itself. So congratulations to everyone who is, you know, helping support this effort. So there's a lot good that's happening too, but in terms of these, these regional DPH, you know, um, clinics, we're, we're, we're getting the shaft. And I yeah. still want to say on the record, and Greta's gone, unfortunately, like we have been preparing to do this for 20 years. The state has been funding these emergency preparedness coalitions but millions and millions of dollars for the last 20 years to get ready for this event. We have the plans on a local community level and we have the plans on regional levels. And we have drilled and exercised these plans over and over again as part of the deliverables by the state in order to get this funding. And then to have the rug just taken out from underneath us, it hurts. And yeah it's not efficient. And they're hiring these third party vendors to do the vaccinations that have no public health background whatsoever. They're, they're using facilities that are costing a million dollars a month just to vaccinate there, never mind everything else on top of that. And at our facility, uh, you know, first dose, second dose, so say we're giving out 2000 vaccines a week, it's costing under $5,000 for electricity, facility, for staff. I mean, we know how to do this. And it's a shame. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mer I'm sorry. Go ahead. Meredith, I, I, I don't wanna bring this up, but, uh, but I just, it's not on you. Um, I'm worried about vaccine hesitancy and how we can do something. <laughs> You're trying to get people to get vaccinated and, and then there's this other conundrum. Is, is there any efforts statewide, uh, uh, anybody addressing this at all? Um, so yeah, so this is def definitely a topic um, that the state is addressing and they're doing all sorts of public you know, PSAs around vaccine hesitancy. Um, Smith College last night did a really good forum around yeah. vaccine hesitancy, talking about the different types of vaccines that are out there and, um, and reasons why people aren't getting vaccinated at this point, but may in the future. So the conversations are starting to happen. I think it will, you know, it's only a matter of weeks before we do some type of public forum around hesitancy. Um, and I feel the more people that are getting vaccinated and talking to their friends and family about the experience um, will only help with, you know, people kind of saying, okay, I'm ready for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You yeah. know, the big part of it is honestly, Cynthia, you know, at a minimum, most trials for vaccines, you would never get through under 10 years. Most of them are probably even closer to 50 years, right? Um, and people are like, well, what the heck? COVID just came out, you know, 13 months ago. But by the time we had a vaccine, which was in December, it was 11 months. How can this be safe? You know, and I think kind of getting that information out there, they feel a lot of people feel like the FDA might have skipped steps or jumped through hoops to get this approved. And they and if we could actually, and probably Dr. Levin might be the best to explain this, they can explain how like there's three phases in a trial. The first two were merged, but the third phase of the trial, which is the most important phase of the trial actually went through its complete phase. Um, I think that's the type of information that needs to get out there. Yeah, there might've been some steps that were shortened, but the most important parts of all trials still did happen. The subject group might have been a little smaller than what we're used to, but Dr. Yep. Levin, help me here. This is yeah, not my, yeah. my wheelhouse. I'll, I'll send you a, a bunch of slides. I just gave a, a talk, a, 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 not about this in particular, but it's sort of just a little update. Um, there is a really nice slide that shows all the different steps um, of how a vaccine gets approved. And I, I, I don't understand exactly myself what 
is different now compared to another vaccine. I mean, you certainly didn't have millions of people vaccinated before it was approved, uh, but we certainly have millions of people vaccinated now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we can talk about that. But I, you know, interestingly, I've, I have a lot of patients who are hesitant and my, you know, my patients are at risk. Um, and after I talk to them about it and tell them, you know, what to expect and that I got it and that it's gonna, you know, it's your immune system that's giving you the reactions and that's not an allergy. Like when people are given the information, they tend to say, oh, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll get that. Um, I just want to say one other thing about statistics and where we are right now. You know, I've, I've followed the stats that we have through our testing center, a lot less testing than there used to be because I think our general volume of symptomatic people is down. Um, but we hit our peak, I think it was also early or maybe the second week in January. And in our statistics, we're not looking at Hampshire County, we're just looking at all comers to Cooley and that's sort of a wider, wider net. Um, but we hit at our peak something almost 9% positivity, but we get the symptomatic people perhaps mm -hmm. more than, than you might. But, um, and then about five weeks ago, we had the steep slope down uh, to 3%. And for about the last five weeks, it's been really steady at 3% and really not dropping. Um, for the last few weeks at Cooley, we've had either zero or one inpatients. Um, and then a couple of days ago, you know, we had three, pa three patients admitted all in one night. So now we have four in the house. And I really, really fear that we are having another, going to have another bump. And I don't know if it's going to be a little bump or a big bump, but I really, um, I think this variant, this B117 variant is, is hitting us right now. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, it causes increased transmission. It may cause slightly worse disease. It's really been hard for them to, the experts to sort of figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, but even a small increase in transmissibility means a huge increase in numbers. And this is thought to be sort of what, 70% more transmissible or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It just means doubling time and, and, and you know, are not the, that number of people that one person can infect is increased and it just makes those, those charts go, you know, those numbers go off the chart. So I'm really fearful of that. Um, and but with people letting their guard down and all, you know, us just pushing through uh, Governor Baker's open up plan, you know, yeah. on March yeah. 22nd, you've got that. And we don't have enough people vaccinated. We're, we're, we're like in the eye of the storm. I really feel like with these projections, we're going to see another surge. And it terrifies me. Yeah. I have to say the one saving grace is that we think our vaccines work against the B117 variant. Um, and so I think we're still in that race between how fast can we vaccinate mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. what people's behaviors are going to be and, mm -hmm. and opening up. Um, you know, the warm weather can't come fast enough because when people are outside, it's a whole lot safer. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really, really fearful about what's happening over the next few weeks. Um, wow. So, uh, so to answer your question, yes, we're, we're thinking about that. We're going to do some type of forum again, hopefully soon, but we're also going to include, you know, a lot of people when we're doing our, our registration for our elderly, there are, they're vaccine shopping. They want certain vaccines. And our message needs to be take whatever you can get now first. Like mm -hmm. don't don't wait. Don't vaccine shop. Yep, don't wait. So I think that's an important message to get out to. Does anybody have anything um, else they wanted to bring up or any other questions for Meredith? I I do not know. So just a couple other updates really quickly. This weekend, we're going to, um, I'm going to amend our farmer's market order that we have. I'm also looking at our venues and outdoor gatherings. I'm going to keep them in a line with the state, but we're going to have embedded into that um, certain restrictions, um, but at least the capacities will be the same. Um, also, just want to let you know, I had my first of two budget meetings with the mayor 
Um, I asked for an assistant director because this is not sustainable. And I don't think this is the last time that we're gonna be in this position. Um, so that got approved. So yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good for you. So, yeah, That's well, huge. I know. Um, I'm thrilled because as soon as that person is onboarded, I'm out for five months. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. Um, <laughs> well, actually, that was my question for you. How can you get any other work done if you're a vaccine clinic all day? You, just, you have so to get challenging. someone else. Yeah, yeah you, yeah. Can't so really do, you can't do both. No. So, so we have that. Um, I've got both public health nurses 40 hours a week on the budget now. That's not going anywhere. So before, one of them was paid with CARES money, CARES Act money. They're now part of my um, PNS, which is fantastic moving forward. I'm also going to be hiring a grants manager because you know we have about um, eight or nine grants right now that I'm supposed to be managing. And um, like Joanne said, my 99.5% of my time is completely COVID and has been for the last um, 12 months like all, all, everything else has really um, has been subpar and it's not acceptable. So I need someone else to help keep things afloat. So the mayor's recognized this. I've recognized this, like I can't do it all. Um, and thankfully he supports that. So good. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my whole staff, I just kind of huge shout out to them. Everybody's working way above and beyond you know, 80 hours a week. It's just incredible. Yeah, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. No, we're, and we feel it. There are days that we feel it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're like family and we're fighting and we have growing <laughs> pains. And <laughs> it's interesting to say the least, but. Mm -hmm. I, it was, I was encouraged. I, I did get my vaccine at the senior center. It was unbelievable, positive experience. And one of the volunteers told me, um, as I said to her, uh, I'd like to volunteer after I get my second one. And she said, you know what, Lauren put up a list for volunteers for next week. And she said, and I went to get a cup of coffee. I came back, the list was filled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not a bad just, problem to have. Yeah. So it takes, it takes 46 to 49 people to run a clinic and it's half paid staff and half volunteers. Um, probably actually it's more 40, 60, 60% being the volunteers every single day that we're open. And she puts out that link and it's people are just snatching up. Amazing. And, and it's not people taking the, they, their incentive might have been to get the vaccine because that was allowed by the rollout plan, but it's people coming back and wanting to give back to the community. I, those are our volunteers that we're seeing that, you know, are taking up those spots. Very few first doses are given to our volunteers every single day, which is great. Yep. Oh, awesome. Bill Hargraves has been there probably a half a dozen times. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Which is great. Nice. He was one of our best MRC volunteers throughout time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for all the work you do on behalf of us and our city. Um, just, uh, it's just all amazing. All amazing. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Yes. Of course. All right, thank you. Any uh, final? Final comments? Anyone want to make a motion? A motion to close the meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Lauren? Oh, yes. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne, yes. Thank you so much.